Inspiring interviews with today's top landlords. This is the Rental Income Podcast. And now, Dan Lane. Michael, tell us what you're doing with your rentals. Yeah, what I'm doing is I'm purchasing properties that would rent for about $2,500 or so uh, a month in my rental market. And with some adjustments, I've been able to get that number up to $3,500 to $4,000 a month in rental income. Here's what Michael's doing. He's buying single family houses. And instead of just putting one tenant in the property, he's putting two tenants in there. One family rents the upstairs part of the house. And then he turns the basement into a separate apartment and rents that to an entirely different tenant. And in doing this, he's taken a house that after all the expenses wasn't really making that much money. And he's turned it into a property that's generating a ton of cash flow every month. On the podcast today, Michael's going to share with us exactly what he's doing. He'll give us more details on exactly how this works. And hopefully this will help you decide if this is something that you should consider. Joining us on the podcast today from Toronto is Michael Dominguez. We'll take a really quick break to thank our sponsors. We'll come right back and we'll talk to Michael. It's a lot of work to find a really good rental property. And when you actually find that property, you want to make sure you're working with a lender that can get that loan closed. The lender that I recommend is Chaley Ridge from Ridge Lending Group. She's a nationwide lender and her specialty is helping investors finance rental properties. She has a ton of loan programs and she can find something customized to you for your situation. If you want to find out more or you're ready to get started today, just go to ridgelendinggroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E lendinggroup.com, NMLS 42056. A good deal on a rental property isn't going to last very long. To win properties today, you need to move quickly when a deal comes on the market, but it takes time to analyze a property. I want to let you know about an app where you can analyze deals on your phone in seconds. It's called Ask Rick. That's R-I-C for Rental Income Calculator. You can analyze a deal with the push of a button. You can figure out the rent, your mortgage payment, your expenses, and figure out the cash flow. If the numbers make sense, you can make an offer right there on the app, or you can send a calendar invite to your agent to see the property in person. Ask Rick is currently offering a free seven-day trial. Just search for Ask Rick in the App Store or go to Just Ask Rick. That's R-I-C, JustAskRick.com. Rental Income Podcast. Michael, this idea sounds really interesting. Give us some more details. Tell me how this works. Yeah, in in my market, we have um, properties with full basements. Now, I realize, you know, depending on where people are listening, there are other opportunities. But essentially what I'm doing is I'm creating an additional dwelling unit in my home. So I'm taking a single family home and creating in many cases a one or two bedroom ensuite. Um, now in my cases, it's a basement, but, and we're, we're creating it and we're turning it into a legal two unit dwelling or a single family home with an additional dwelling unit. And I'm getting wonderful tenants and it's, uh, uh, it's generating the kind of rental income needed to cover all of my expenses. That's really incredible. Okay, so are you having to do a lot of modifications to the basement? Because I guess like the basement is almost like a like a full apartment. So I Correct. do you have to like do a lot of modifications? Like I guess you're probably putting in a kitchen. Is there anything else you, you that you're doing in the basements? Absolutely. In many cases, whatever is existing in this unit is being ripped out and started from scratch. Because um, as I as I talk about to others, essentially what I'm doing is I'm, I'm taking a, um, uh, let's call it a box. And what I'm doing is I'm taking a larger box, which is a home and I'm creating two smaller boxes within the, within the first box. And so each one needs to meet all of the, uh, the fire and building codes of your municipality or state or province. And, um, and so, so everything from, from fire safety and drywall, Obviously, we're creating a kitchen, a bathroom, one or two bedrooms. We're tra- we're creating an entire apartment, and there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff, behind the wall stuff, which is needed to create this suite. But at the end of the day, um, it's a one time expense, and not only is it getting the higher rental income, but it's tremendously increasing the value. And in many cases, I've been able to refinance those properties based on the higher purchase or the higher value at that time. And in many cases, getting my initial investment out of it. 
how much are you generally spending to rehab the basement? Yeah, the numbers are changing constantly now, as we all know, with the supply chain issues, the labor cost and the material cost have been rising up tremendously. Now, I'm in a, in a 1,000 square foot, two bedroom apartment may cost, if I was hiring out a full contractor team and doing it all, about $100,000 Canadian or about $80,000 or so American. Uh, so big number. But yeah. at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's, it's raising up my value of my property by just that much in my market. And then for the upstairs, do you generally have to do anything to the upstairs unit? What I'm typically doing is obviously we're doing the full fire separation. And I don't want to negate that as being a, just a, just a, oh, yeah, I got to do that. But it's um, uh, one of the things that's most important if you're going to be an investor and a long-term, uh, long-term landlord is you want to make sure your properties are safe for whoever is living in those units. So uh, meeting a 45-minute fire safety code is very important. And there is you know following the, the rules and regulations set forth by – by your local government is is integral. But the other thing I'm doing as well is in many cases I'm adding ensuite laundry right into each unit because I don't necessarily want to have my my tenants interacting with themselves with each other very often. The other thing I need to do from the ex- outside is in many cases I'm getting a separate driveway so that uh, or du- widening the driveway so that each unit has their own um, you know drive driveway opportunities. So I don't I can't imagine uh, one tenant knocking on the other tenant's door at two in the morning wanting to get out. We have to separate it that way. Right. So it's almost like you're turning the house into a duplex. Correct. Yeah. So actually, and a lot of people you mis- misstate that by calling it a duplex. And the a duplex is a purpose-built building, whereas this was built as a single-family home, and then it was uh, retrofitted to having the secondary suite. So that's where the additional dwelling unit or the secondary suite or whatever the, whatever the term is in your market. But yeah, it's, it's, it's like a duplex, but yeah. it's not officially a duplex. And now you mentioned earlier that this is a legal process. So I, I guess that's something that people should, should check on before they do this because n- not every town or county is going to be okay with this. Like this is Correct. something that's going to vary from area to area. So in in your town, is there any kind of approval process that you had to go through to to be able to do this? A hundred percent. It's it's and it's not a simple process. Like, obviously, the first time you do it, um, a lot of people compare it to giving birth. It's 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 a painful experience, and you swear you're never going to do it again. But once you get your bouncing baby boy, you say, "Oh, that's pretty good," and then you decide you want to do it again and have a second child. And, and it's honestly a lot like that as well. There are a lot of steps in the process, but once you've done it one or two times, it just gets easier because you know what the municipality or the city is mm-hmm. looking for. Uh, but absolutely, there's a lot of steps and a lot of legalization. And you, you nailed it when you said not every municipality can do this. Not every market is a quality market and not every quality market allows you to be able to do the secondary suite opportunities. There are some markets in the United States like Oregon, for example, or California, where they're very on side with secondary suites. And then there's others that are, that are not so much. Right. Yeah. And like with a lot of areas, I've seen an actual detached unit that you can build, like it maybe in the backyard or something. Absolutely. There's coach houses. There's, um, there's, there's the ability of adding an apartment above a garage. There's the ability of replacing a garage with a secondary suite. There's tiny houses. Every municipality has their own tweaks. Uh, in California, the big thing that people are doing is they've got a fairly large backyard. And so they're building sort of an extension to their backyard of you're building a one or two bedroom apartment. That's essentially, you know, it shares, it shares a common wall. So in that case, there's not nearly the fire separation between the two units because there's just one wall, uh, whereas a basement would have far more. Uh, some people are building a secondary suite by, uh, believe it or not, building – if let's say it's a one-story unit, they're building a second story above the first unit. In this. So there's multiple ways across North America where people are doing sure. exactly that. What about utilities? How, how do you deal with that? Do you have separate meters for each unit or is it – one one meter for the whole house the the biggest 
cause of concern before I started to charging the charge the tenants is I would show up at my property in the middle of February on the coldest day. And meanwhile, they've got their windows open because they want fresh air. Mm. So how we uh, account for it is um, if let's say it's a bungalow that's three bedrooms and a, and a two bedroom basement apartment. What we're doing is if let's say you're the upper tenant, you're paying essentially 60% of the utilities and I'm the lower tenant paying 40% of the utilities. So how we're doing the calculation for that is because we own a number of our properties. We know our utility bills tend to be about $400 a month. So we're actually charging you. If let's say you're paying me rent of $2,000, we may charge you $2,200 and you are essentially prepaying the utility bill for that extra $200. And then I'm paying maybe another 150 or 200 dollars on the basement. And then at the end of three or four months, we reconcile that and we find out what the actual bills were. And and at that time, you either get a credit for any overpayments you've done, or you receive an invoice for anything that you've underpaid. And so the net result is, is that we're essentially getting getting the utilities paid for by the tenants mm. and we're not out the money. Right. I like that. I like that. All right, now let's talk about the numbers again. I, I know you mentioned this at the beginning. So it, when you buy the properties, if you were just to rent it out the the way it was without doing anything, how much would you get renting out the entire house? Uh, a full house would rent for about twenty five to twenty eight hundred okay. in my market plus plus utilities. That's that's what we're, right. That's what people are willing to pay. They they just they just can't pay more than that. It's uh, it's just taking too much of their budget otherwise. And then how is it broken down? Like how much are you generally renting the upstairs for, and how much? I guess so. The upstairs is twenty five hundred. But what about the? Oh, I guess are you getting twenty five hundred no, for the upstairs? That's that's the whole advantage for the tenant too because. I'm able to attract uh, A tenants, people with incredible credit scores and people that are future home buyers. And why they would not rent the full house by my neighbor, perhaps, and rent my place is I might be offering that rent for, they're only getting the upper level now, and they might rent it for $2,000, $2,100, $2,200, depending on the location, the quality. So they're saving 10 to 20% from what they'd be paying if they were renting out the whole house, including the basement. So they're seeing a savings and it's a win for them. Mm -hmm. And, and then the basement, because we're getting a full basement apartment, the rent numbers are really strong in my market. There's essentially zero vacancy. So we're getting about 16 to $1,800 for the basement. So at the end of the day, we're getting uh, anywhere from 3,500 to in one case, we're getting $4,000 in rental income per month with uh, the tenants paying utilities. That's incredible. Now, if you weren't doing this, if you were just renting out the house regularly, would the numbers work? Like, would you be able to cover the mortgage and your expenses at 2,500 a month? Yeah, those are what I call portfolio killers. And the challenge with that is I could probably do it because I have a pretty good nine to five income in the past. So I could have supported one or two properties, but the problem is, is that um, they would be absolutely negative cash flowing properties, and I'd have to dip into them every single month. And you know, the, people can rationalize anything, and they can say, "Well, I could support the extra thousand dollars in cost because these things are in great locations and they're appreciating nicely." And that may be true, but the reality is, is that if bad stuff happens. And you lose your job, or you have a heart attack, or a stroke, or just you know, just some bad circumstances happen. You're in a position where you can't fill that extra few hundred dollars or that extra thousand dollars a month in in rental income. You're forced to sell it. Whereas if I lost my job tomorrow, these properties are covering themselves and actually supporting me in some manner, and they're not only appreciating by leaps and bounds because they're in great markets, but they're also covering themselves cash flow wise. I love it. I love it. And you've been able to do this multiple times, right? Like you, you've got multiple houses that you've you've done this to? I don't want to be a hands-on investor. I don't want to be constantly chasing people for rents. I'm looking for really great quality tenants. And how I do that is I look for quality properties in really good quality neighborhoods that people want to live in. The people I want to rent to want to live there. And, and then they will be very attracted to my property because I'm renovating and fixing it well. 
And the net result is, is that I'm spending in many cases, my portfolio, I've got 12 of these legal two unit dwellings. I don't have to have a million properties to make my numbers work. Mm. Uh, I have a dozen and even as little as two or three can change your life. And, and they're appreciating well, they're covering themselves. And then over time, as the rental numbers have been increasing in my market, uh, the cash flow numbers have been getting historically better and better because obviously my, um, my mortgage and my taxes are pretty much staying the same or slightly going up. So I'm actually incre- increasing my cash flow over time. Yeah, I mean, it's a really awesome strategy because like, these sound like th- these are like A-class neighborhoods that, that you're buying it in. So you're buying an A-class property, which is generally going to appreciate more than like say a B or a C class property. So you've got that extra appreciation in there, but what you're generally lacking in an A class neighborhood is the cash flow, but you figured out how to get the cash flow and the appreciation all in one house. Yes. That's so 100%. awesome. Yeah. yeah. And, and so just the kind of properties I am looking for is I know you live in the greater DC area. Mm-hmm. And, and so what we're looking for in a market is, and let's not talk about whether the the municipality or the city will allow it. Let's let's address that another time. But you know what I'm looking for in a market is something that uh, where the town is seeing population growth, it's seeing GDP growth, it's seeing uh, employment growth, and all of these things are pushing things upwards. And as more people are moving to that community, you're seeing the rent numbers increasing, you're seeing the property values increasing. The challenge with buying a property in a market that's a tertiary market where the values haven't increased in a decade or two decades, like a a Buffalo, New York, for example, is I can get a really great deal there. And on paper, I can get some incredible cash flow numbers. But the problem is, is that even if I do cash flow on that property, the odds of that property really jumping in value over time isn't that good because the demand just isn't there. As population numbers decrease, the values just aren't going up. In my market, we're seeing population growing by 1% to 2% a year. It's crazy growth mm-hmm. here in the Toronto area. And, um, and as more and more people move to my community, my properties have become more and more popular. And we're seeing v- property – like obviously during COVID, everything's been crazy. But, uh, but since, t- in, since 2000, so we're talking 21 years here, we've been averaging about a 7 to 8% annualized growth over that time frame. So just simply riding the wave and cash flowing at the same time and seeing that kind of growth with the leveraging opportunities that real estate affords, it's been a really lucrative investment for me. Yeah, it sure sounds like it. So have you always had this strategy? Have you always bought good properties and good neighborhoods? Or did you ever venture into some lesser properties? Yeah, I wish I could tell you that I was smart enough to figure this out right away, but I did what everyone else did. And, and you know, everyone, and again, I'm not saying that their strategies are poor, but I did the strategy that everyone talks about. And, you know, the, the most common story is make it on the buy. If you, if you don't make money on the buy, you can't make money in real estate. And I believe that to be a true statement. And so I bought uh, poor properties that were in really poor repair in in secondary and tertiary markets and my first property i bought was a sixplex and the second property i bought was a duplex on a busy street with very poor tenant profile and and i struggled and it almost broke me i'm going to be honest with you is i was doing this for a couple of years and i was constantly going to landlord tenant boards and dealing with crappy tenants and and it was really frustrating it was becoming a full-time job for me and so it was almost like an aha moment. I had a mentor that uh, sort of said, well, just buy the, you know, you know where the better properties are. Why don't you buy some of them? And so honestly, I bought a couple of them almost by mistake. I got a good price or two. And all of a sudden I saw the difference in the tenant profile. And it was like a light bulb moment where I said, geez, I should do more of that. And over time, I've sold my properties that I that I wouldn't purchase today. And I've just kept the properties in the portfolio that that are ones that I could see myself holding for five or 10 or 20 years. Yeah. Wow. And so in, and today with your A-class properties, do you have any tenant problems at all? Or are all your tenants just kind of perfect tenants? <laughs> well, I never want to say perfect, but I could tell you that 
I'm also I'm I'm a semi-retired or mostly retired realtor, and so I um, I also helped a number of my clients purchase those type of properties as well. So we have not just my twelve properties times two of twenty four tenants, but let's expand that to over three hundred properties in my market. So we're talking six hundred to maybe even as many as eight hundred tenants. And so when COVID started. Um, there was a real talk in big cities where landlords were not receiving their money. And so I reached out to a lot of my clients in March, April, May of 2020 to ask how many tenants were not paying the rent. And the answer was zero, zero. Like there were a couple tenants that hadn't been paying the rent before and they were in the process of evicting, but zero tenants in, in all of my clients' properties did not pay the rent. And I can tell you, I stopped asking people after about three or four months because it was just a waste of my time. But I can tell you in my personal portfolio, not only I've had zero vacancies during the entire COVID uh, pandemic, but my rents have increased and uh, and I've had zero vacancies, uh, zero vacancies, zero missed rents, zero, zero everything. Michael has written a book called Armchair Real Estate Millionaire, where he talks more about his story and kind of gives a template on how you can build long-term wealth with rental properties. You can find it on Amazon, or I've got a link to it on my website. You can find that at rentalincomepodcast.com slash episode 348. I'd like to thank today's sponsor for making this episode possible. It's Chaley Ridge from Ridge Lending Group. Chaley is a nationwide lender, and her specialty is helping investors finance rental properties. She has a ton of different loan programs, and she can help you find something customized to you for your situation. If you want to find out more or you want to set up a time to talk to Chaley personally, just go to RidgeLendingGroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E lendinggroup.com nmls42056 thank you so much for checking out the podcast today make sure you follow the show we put out new interviews every single tuesday and if you follow or subscribe you'll get notified as soon as new episodes come out my name is dan lane and this has been the rental income podcast